Hey there, it's Kathy. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to History of the 90s early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. In December 1989, a group of writers and their young families gathered at a bowling alley to celebrate the beginning of a new chapter in their lives. A groundbreaking TV show they'd been working on around the clock was about to premiere on a brand new television network. They were proud of it, but the show was so unique, they didn't expect it to last more than a season. So when the early reviews came out that night, the team of writers and producers were shocked. Critics called it a game changer, and viewers loved it too. The show had debuted with the highest ratings ever achieved by the fledgling network. But no one could have predicted it would soon become a cultural phenomenon that would last over 30 years. I'm Kathy Kanzora, and this is History of the 90s, a podcast about a decade that changed the world. On this episode, we look back at one of TV's most popular families. And you'll want to stick around because we have a very special guest for this episode. Just in case you don't know The Simpsons' origin story and how it started out as a short cartoon on The Tracy Ullman Show, let me do a little recap. In the spring of 1987, the brand new Fox TV network launched its first primetime original programming block on Sunday nights. It included Married with Children and a funny little variety show hosted by British comedian Tracy Ullman. Ullman's show has been described as an omelette of character skits, songs, and cartoons that highlighted her immense talents. Matthew Clickstein, co-author of the book Springfield Confidential, says Ullman was a real Renaissance woman. Her show was really an exhibition for everything she can do and everything that she was. And she was bringing together the new, the old. You had some Benny Hill sensibility. You had some Faulty Tower sensibility. You had some Monty Python sensibility, obviously. Um, But, you know, you also had a certain punk rock ethos, a certain 80s pop culture ethos with music. Sounds great, right? Well, critics loved it, but viewers, not so much. So the show's executive producer, the great James L. Brooks of Mary Tyler Moore and Taxi fame, decided to retool things a bit. He was a big fan of a Los Angeles comic strip called Life in Hell, which featured the existential musings of angst-ridden rabbits and an identical-looking fez-wearing gay couple named Akbar and Jeff. Brooks wanted to bring in some animation to the Tracy Ullman show, so he set up a meeting with the Life in Hell cartoonist, a young guy by the name of Matt Groening. Matt had a few ideas for what they could do for some animation, but as soon as he was getting there and waiting in the office, he realized anything he gave them, they would own. Fox would own and James L. Brooks would own. So on the spot, he decided to just come up with a different concept. And it was essentially a parody of not only the American family, but his family. Uh, His mother is named March. His father's name is Homer. His sister's name is Lisa. He has another sister named Maggie. And um, Bart, some say, was because Bart's basically him, but it's an anagram of brat. Brooks was sold on the idea, and Groening soon developed cartoon shorts that would be used as bumpers. Brief clips that run just before or after a commercial break. Fox has never officially released the shorts anywhere, and only a few can be found on YouTube, including this one, which was the first one aired on The Tracy Ullman Show. Um, Dad? Yeah? What is the mind? Is it just a system of impulses, or is it something tangible? Relax. What is mind? No matter. What is matter? Never mind. <laughs> In all, Groening created 48 Simpsons shorts for The Tracy Ullman Show that ran over a two-year period. The shorts stood out right from the beginning for a couple of reasons. The content was kind of raunchy and crude, especially compared to many of the wholesome families that were on the air at the time, like Growing Pains and The Cosby Show. Plus, the animation itself was filled with sharp, jagged, irregular lines, a far cry from the soft, pleasing style of Disney cartoons. 
On The Simpsons, the kids' heads were pointy, and everybody looked as if they'd just been electrocuted. And then there were the colors, bright yellow skin and blue hair, which according to legend were added kind of as a joke by the animators. A tiny animation shop called Klasky Shupo won The Simpsons contract by underbidding other competitors, and apparently they threw in the colors for free to clinch the deal. You might remember from the episode we did on Nickelodeon last season that Klasky Shupo went on from The Simpsons to produce The Rugrats, which also contained a bunch of weird-looking characters. The Tracy Ullman bumper episodes were 20 or 30 seconds long and featured amusing snippets of the dysfunctional family's daily life. They focused mostly on the kids getting into trouble. Things like Bart and Lisa having a burping contest, Bart directing pallbearers at a funeral as if he were the foreman on a construction site, that kind of stuff. Yardley Smith was a 22-year-old actor living in L.A. who hadn't really considered doing voiceover work prior to getting the call to audition for the cartoon. My agent said, "Okay, you're going to go out and audition for this little cartoon that's going to be part of this sketch comedy show called Tracy Ullman and on a brand new network called Fox. And I was like, what? You want me to what? And I, (laughs) but I really never, I almost never turned down an audition. Yardley initially read for the part of Bart Simpson, but she was told she sounded too much like a girl. So she tried out for the part of Bart's younger sister, Lisa. And then I got a call back and I read for Matt Groening and I remember he didn't laugh at all. Didn't, and I was like, oh, oh, I guess I didn't get that job. But I was not that broken up about it because again, voiceover wasn't really on my checklist. So. And then I did get the job, and I, and I was like, great, the job is what? We're doing what? Because we were doing these little bumpers on Tracy Allman, right? It was quite unusual, but I loved the character, right? Even early Lisa Simpson, before she was fleshed out. So I was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Joining Yardley on the cast were Dan Castellaneta as Homer Simpson, the beer and donut-loving head of the family, Julie Kavner as Marge, the gravelly-voiced heart of gold mother, and Nancy Cartwright as hell-raising Bart Simpson. Tracy Ullman and a couple of her castmates also provided voices of various Springfielders in the original shorts. As you may remember, Springfield is the name of the generic town where the Simpsons live, and it's apparently modeled after a town near where Matt Groening grew up in Oregon. By 1989, Fox executives decided that Bart Simpson and family deserved their own show, James L. Brooks put writer-producer Sam Simon in charge of developing a unique half-hour show. This wouldn't be the typical Saturday morning cartoon, but a prime-time animated sitcom for adults. It wasn't the first prime-time cartoon. That honor goes to The Flintstones, which debuted on ABC in September 1960, nearly 30 years before. Then there was The Jetsons, which had a short run from 1962 to 63, And after that, wait till your father gets home in the 1970s. When Fox decided to air an animated sitcom, there hadn't been anything like it in nearly 20 years. And Matthew Clickstein says it was a pretty radical move. But Fox was trying to create themselves as a brand that would say, we're the younger channel, we are this more radical channel, we're going to have shows like In Living Color, we're going to have Arsenio Hall, we're going to have Joan Rivers, we're going to have Married with Children. People forget that, especially considering what Fox has become now or mixing it up with the, uh, what Fox News has become, Fox at the time was extremely revolutionary was extremely radical. There was ABC, there was CBS, and there was NBC. Cable television was still only just getting started. So the very idea that there would be a whole new channel was in in and of itself as an idea very radical and revolutionary. And to their credit, the people at Fox leaned into that. It's hard to imagine now, but hiring writers for The Simpsons was a big challenge. No one wanted to work on a primetime cartoon on a brand new TV network. It just seemed too risky. Original Simpsons writer Mike Reese says in Springfield Confidential, the book he co-wrote with Matthew Clickstein, that he took the job after getting passed over for another gig that he really wanted. Reese says he didn't tell anyone what he was doing because after eight years writing for films and sitcoms, going to write for a cartoon 
felt like he had hit rock bottom. Matthew Clickstein says Reese didn't have high expectations for the show. And as Mike tells the story, uh, the first run was going to be 13 episodes and uh, everyone went around the room to talk about how long they thought the show would last. And everyone said six weeks, six weeks, six weeks, which is presumably six episodes. And uh, I believe it was Sam Simon who said, no, I think it'll run for 13 weeks. But don't worry, no one will ever see it. This won't hurt your career. Maybe that was the secret to the show's success. Since they thought no one was watching, they didn't make the same boring show normally seen on TV. Instead, the writers made one they wanted to see. Unpredictable episodes with snappy scenes and dialogue packed with jokes, both in the foreground and in the background. In other words, it was the opposite of boring. The first finished episode, which was meant to be The Simpsons pilot, was called Some Enchanted Evening. The plot has the notorious babysitter bandit trying to rob the Simpsons' house while Homer and Marge are having a romantic night away from the kids. But when Fox executives and writers sat down to watch it, they thought it was a total disaster. According to Mike Reese, the animation felt completely wrong. He says the Simpsons' house was bendy, Homer was wiggly, and all of Springfield seemed to be made out of rubber. You see, producing the volume of animation needed for that first 13-episode season was a huge challenge. So a bunch of the work had to be farmed out to studios in Korea, which was used to animating cartoons like Transformers. And it didn't help that neither James L. Brooks or Matt Groening had little animation experience. As a result, there was a huge learning curve for them. According to Reese, the first episode was so bad, he was surprised that it wasn't the end of The Simpsons right then and there. Luckily, a second episode came in the next week, and it looked much better. In fact, it looked great. The pilot was sent back to be fixed, and the intended launch of the show in September 1989 was delayed by three months. That's why the first episode of The Simpsons, which premiered on December 17th, 1989, was a Christmas special called Simpsons Roasting on an Open Fire. Isn't Bart sweet, Homer? He sings like an angel. Oh, jingle bells, Batman smells, Robin lays an egg. The Batmobile broke its wheel, the Joker got a wh- ah! In that premiere, Homer takes a job as a department store Santa after the family's emergency money is spent on tattoo removal for Bart. Homer then risks his earnings at the track on a dog named Santa's Little Helper, who becomes the family's pet. It's classic Simpsons. Weird, but also smart and witty. This family was rough around the edges, and according to Yardley, also soft in the middle. Even as dysfunctional as the Simpsons are, they really love each other. They're just not perfect. And maybe that was groundbreaking at the time. Matthew Clickstein agrees. It's a goofy episode, it's a funny episode, but there is some real heart. There's some real love for the animal, love for the family, love for, 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 for each other and for their town, for their community, for their school. A fun fact about that episode, Gwen Stefani's brother Eric was one of the layout artists. You'll remember from our episode on 90 Ska, Eric was a founding member of No Doubt, but left the band to pursue a career in animation. The Simpsons, in the meantime, was an instant hit. Not just with viewers, but with critics as well. It was clear that the country and more or less world thereafter very quickly was ready for The Simpsons, wanted The Simpsons, needed The Simpsons. It was time for an animated family like The Simpsons to come out. And um, as soon as it did, right out of the gate, I mean... They they were get they they it was like a Broadway opening. Because the show had grown from 30-second shorts to a half-hour program, that meant the cast of characters needed to expand outside the immediate family. So writers came up with Marge's spinster sisters, Patty and Selma, along with Homer's neglected father, Grandpa Simpson. Plus, there was Mo the bartender and Krusty the Clown. And Homer's boss at the nuclear power plant where he worked, the 104-year-old Mr. Burns. Excellent. Veteran improv actors and comedians like Hank Azaria, Harry Shearer, and the late Phil Hartman lent their brilliant voices and talent to help bring the supporting cast to life. During that first season, viewers also got to see the real Lisa Simpson. 
She began as Bart Simpson's hell-raising sidekick in the original shorts. But producer James L. Brooks wanted her to be more. He wanted her to be some kind of child prodigy. So Matt Groening fleshed out the character and decided she would become a talented saxophone player. Why the sax? Well, Groening thought it looked funny. A little girl with this big, huge, oddly shaped instrument. But he also thought the sorrowful tones of the sax implied that Lisa was super smart and mature beyond her seven years. The first episode that centered on Lisa was called Moaning Lisa. It was the sixth episode of the first season, and in it, Lisa is struggling with a bad case of the blues, which she tries to explain to her dad. I'm just wondering, what's the point? Would it make any difference at all if I never existed? How can we sleep at night when there's so much suffering in the world? Well, uh, uh, come on, Lisa, ride the Homer horsey. Giddy up, whee! When her family can't help, Lisa meets jazz musician Bleeding Gums Murphy, who helps lift her spirits by teaching her how to express her feelings through music. My dad acts like he belongs. He belongs in the zoo. I'm the saddest kid. In grade number two. Lisa was more than the saddest kid in grade two. She was also a precocious reader, a feminist, an animal rights activist, an environmentalist, and the all-around moral center of the show. She was also the family's beating heart. Matt Groening has described her as the only character on The Simpsons who is not controlled by her base impulses. In other words, she's a deep thinker in a family of goofballs. Yardley Smith says it's no surprise that early on, Lisa Simpson became a role model for many viewers. Really, almost anybody who felt that they didn't belong, anybody who felt slightly disenfranchised, somebody who was like, you know, I always say, so Lisa Simpson, she's a genius and she plays the saxophone, you know, like a like a grown up and And I would say any time as a kid you do something really well, it sets you apart from your peer group. So now you're separate, right? And then you spend a lot of time trying to figure out how do I blend back in but keep this thing that I'm good at, whether it's sports or academics or, you know, theater or anything. Author Matthew Clickstein says right out of the gate, Simpsons writers were tapping into something that resonated with people around the world. Lisa, as a cartoon character, is dealing with, as a child, all these existential issues and why am I sad and what does it mean to be sad and why can't I be happy and and, and is dealing with, with where the blues inside of her comes from. And this is, lest we forget too, this was very early on in the series run where they said, we're going to make people feel sad for an animated little girl with spiky hair that's totally unrealistic. And they pulled it off. By the end of its first season in the spring of 1990, The Simpsons cracked the top 10 in the Nielsen's TV ratings in the U.S. The show was becoming a phenomenon. In particular, Bart Simpson. The character who loved skateboarding and hated school was a mirror image for millions of kids around the U.S. and the world, for that matter. Fox struck a deal with Mattel, and soon talking Bart Simpson dolls were flying off the shelves. And t-shirts emblazoned with classic Bart catchphrases like don't have a cow man and eat my shorts were selling by the millions. But not everyone was a fan of the spiky-haired kid and his habit of talking back. In April 1990, the principal of Lutz Elementary School in Fremont, Ohio, took to the intercom with an important message for his students. William Crumnow declared that for the rest of the school year, there would be a ban on t-shirts that featured Bart Simpson. Since The Simpsons started airing four months earlier, kids had started showing up to school in shirts that said, I'm Bart Simpson, who the hell are you? An underachiever and proud of it, man. That's the one that really bugged Principal Crumnow, who told media at the time that being proud of incompetence was against what educators stand for. He said, we strive for excellence and to instill good values in kids. The show teaches the wrong things to students. And Crumnow wasn't alone. Schools around the country banned Bart Simpson t-shirts. And by the summer of 1990, the retail chain JCPenney decided to take the underachiever shirt off the shelves in kid sizes. Yardley says she never understood the fuss. 
I didn't feel like it was that controversial. I felt like it was smart and uh, funny and, you know, Bart Simpson, I guess it's funny when you think of it now because I feel like so many other things, music, other cartoons are so much racier. Bart Simpson just talked back to his parents. Um, And it was, it's funny to think that that was considered racy and you didn't want your kids to watch it um, when I'm pretty sure kids were talking back to their parents back in 1990 when we spun off into the half hour, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Is that why it was so taboo? Despite the controversy, the show's popularity continued to grow. In its second season, The Simpsons were moved from Sunday night to Thursday night, going head-to-head with The Huxtables. The popular family from The Cosby Show on NBC had ruled the airwaves since the mid-80s, so this was a big move by Fox. In the end, The Cosby Show ended up triumphant in the ratings battle, But Fox was still a winner. Their bold decision to move The Simpsons to Thursday night led to an overall increase in viewership for the network, especially among young viewers, who stayed after The Simpsons was over to watch another new show on the channel called Beverly Hills 90210. Meanwhile, Bart Mania had taken over. By the end of 1990, the spiky-haired brat had appeared on the cover of three major magazines, Time, Newsweek, and Rolling Stone. And the show seemed unstoppable. But around this time, things started to sour behind the scenes between Matt Groening and showrunner and writer Sam Simon. Before joining The Simpsons, Simon had been described as a sitcom prodigy, overseeing big shows like Taxi and Cheers. He was brought into the world of animation by James L. Brooks, and together with Groening, they helped turn The Simpsons into an overnight sensation. Simon was behind some of the show's most iconic characters, including Mr. Burns and the incompetent man in charge of the Springfield Police Department, Chief Wiggum. But from the beginning and to this day, the name most associated with the show is Matt Groening. And Simon felt slighted because of that. He clashed frequently with his co-creator, and that put a strain on the relationship and the show overall. Simon oversaw an episode in season three that he later admitted was a coded message about the situation. In the episode titled Flaming Moe's, Homer tells Moe about a drink he invented called a Flaming Homer. The secret ingredient is cough syrup. Moe ends up stealing the recipe, renames it the Flaming Moe, and takes credit for it. Hey, buddy, have one on the half. Hey, hey, this drink is delicious, and my phlegm feels looser. What do you call it? Well, it's called a flaming mo. It's called a flaming mo. That's right, a flaming mo. My name is Mo, and I invented it. That's why it's called a flaming mo. What? What are you looking at, Homer? It's a flaming mo. I'm mo. It got so bad that Simon left The Simpsons after season four but he retained the title of executive producer and was given royalties from future home video sales, which proved to be incredibly lucrative. In interviews, Simon has said it earned him tens of millions of dollars each year. Sam Simon died of cancer in 2015. He was 59. So what was it about The Simpsons that made it one of the best shows on TV for most of the 1990s? Well, part of it was a writer's room packed with talent. Simpsons writers weren't just funny, they were also incredibly smart. Writers and producers on the show have been graduates of Ivy League schools who studied things like math, physics, and computer science. So mixed in with burps and beer jokes are lots of brilliant lines and deep episodes, like one called Bart Sells His Soul, which happens to be one of Yardley Smith's favorites. It's so quintessentially Simpson. So Bart sells his soul to Millhouse for a dollar and then because he doesn't believe that you have a soul. And then the animation and story reflect the fact that really maybe you do have a soul. It's just something you can't see. So it's a little bit about having faith in the things that aren't right in front of you. And uh, Lisa buys his soul back for five dollars. Author Matthew Clickstein says it wasn't just the smart humor that set it apart. The fact that The Simpsons revolved around a family is an extremely important part of its success. And this is why I think it, it, it resonated both with, with families who enjoyed it and who watched it and said, hey, that's us. 
hey, that those are our neighbors. Hey, those are, you know, that's what's going on in this country right now, dealing with class issues, dealing with family strife, dealing with stress at work, dealing with intermarriage uh, difficulties, dealing with the, the kids finding their own place. Um, all of these very universal topics that we were all going through at around the same time. And kids like myself were able to watch it and see ourselves in Bart and Lisa. Parents were able to watch it and see themselves in Homer and Marge. Um, and, you know, everyone else was able to kind of watch, say, hey, that's me or that's me or that's my brother or sister or that's my friends down the street. The Simpsons worked because they were more relatable than other families on TV. They didn't hide their flaws and they have a lot of them. But not everyone liked this portrayal of a slightly dysfunctional yet loving family. The controversy over The Simpsons that had started with Bart t-shirts heated up again in 1992, when President George H.W. Bush mentioned them in a speech he gave on family values in January of that year. In his address to religious broadcasters, Bush said that American families needed to be a lot more like the Waltons and a lot less like The Simpsons. In case you don't know who the Waltons are, they were a fictional family depicted in a 1970s TV show by the same name. Set in the Virginia mountains, it was a wholesome take on family life during the Depression and World War II. A far cry from The Simpsons. Yardley Smith remembers the moment when President Bush took aim at the show. First of all, you're like, wow, the president is actually paying attention to our show. Um, but also it seemed ridiculous. I, th- I just, we all just went, oh, please. Oh, come on. Bush's comments caused quite a stir. But you know what they say, no publicity is bad publicity. And the show's creators turned it into a comedic opportunity. The next episode that ran of The Simpsons was a repeat of Stark Raving Dad, the one where Homer accidentally lands in a mental hospital and ends up sharing a room with a white man who thinks he's Michael Jackson. This time it featured a different opening, which was produced as a response to Bush's comments. The scene shows the family watching that portion of the president's speech, and Bart responds, hey, we're just like the Waltons. We're praying for an end to the depression too. In case you missed it, the opening can be found on the season four DVD box set. Given the success of The Simpsons, it's no wonder that it soon spawned imitators and opened the door for other adult animated shows in the 90s and beyond. Everything from Beavis and Butthead and The King of the Hill to Family Guy and South Park have The Simpsons to thank for creating a primetime animation audience. In fact, it's pretty tough to find any strain of television comedy that doesn't contain at least a little bit of Simpsons DNA. The Simpsons' impact can also be felt beyond television. Homer's signature exclamation has been added to the Oxford English Dictionary. There's a Simpsons and philosophy course at Berkeley, plus hundreds of published academic articles on the cartoon family. The Simpsons has also been credited with predicting the future. Seriously, you may laugh, but listen to this. Over its 30-plus year run, the series has alluded to many real-life events long before they've actually happened. Including some big things, like the Trump presidency, the discovery of the Higgs boson particle, 9-11, and Disney's takeover of Fox. And some smaller things, too, like three Super Bowl winners, autocorrect, and the FIFA corruption scandal. The list actually goes on and on. There's about 20 or 30 predictions from the show that have come true. But remember, that's from over 30 years of writers working on episodes. They brought on from the very beginning incredibly smart, incredibly intuitive, incredibly funny people. Again, even from the very beginning, from all walks of life. And uh, so, of course, you bring all these people together for 30 plus years, for 800 episodes almost, and they're going to come up with some storylines that are going to end up happening. The Simpsons today holds the record for the longest scripted primetime series. It hit that milestone in 2018 after airing its 636th episode, surpassing the CBS show Gunsmoke, which aired 635 episodes from 1955 to 1975. Celebrations were a bit muted, though, because that same year, The Simpsons were struggling with a controversy 
over its longtime character, Apu. Hank Azaria, who is a white comedian and voice actor, announced he would no longer voice the South Asian immigrant owner of a convenience store. He said he had come to understand why Apu was troubling the community he was supposed to represent. The controversy began a year earlier, in 2017, when comedian Hari Kondabolu released a documentary called The Problem with Apu, which depicted how he felt the character perpetuated ugly and harmful stereotypes about South Asians. In response, Fox announced in 2020 that it would no longer have white actors voice non-white characters, including another character which had been previously voiced by Hank Azaria, Homer's Black co-worker Carlton Carlson. In recent years, there has also been talk about the quality of The Simpsons episodes. Some say they're not up to par, especially compared to the golden years of the show, which is roughly seasons 3 through 12. Keep in mind, they're currently in season 33. Simpsons writer Mike Reese addresses the criticism in Springfield Confidential. He says, quote, When TV shows get old, they get either weird or boring, and we've opted for weird. And Clickstein says, weird or not, the show remains popular around the world. It's never going to go away. I mean, we just know this now. It's never going to go away. And, and because it's just too important to our culture, we look to it for, for guidance. We look to it for understanding. We look to it for connection to each other. Um, when Mike says, you know, it does really well in the Middle East, you know, and people will literally stop fighting uh, so that they can watch The Simpsons and then go back to, to, you know, throwing rocks at each other and whatnot. He, you know, again, you can look at newspaper articles. He's right. And, you know, maybe The Simpsons would bring world peace if it could be taken even a little bit more seriously than it. As for Lisa Simpson's future, Yardley wants for her seven-year-old alter ego the kind of life she would want for her best friend. So I want her to be happy and feel satisfied uh, with whatever her choices are, even if her choices change. I think the days of probably, you know, my father was a journalist his entire career. But I think that generation was probably the last generation to stick with one job. It, it's sort of impractical, I think, to say, oh, I hope Lisa Simpson becomes a blah. Because even if she became president, that's only an eight-year job. So <laughs> at best. Whatever happens to Lisa and the rest of the Simpson family is yet to come. And even though the writers have predicted many future events, there have been no hints from them on how or if the show will ever end. Because in the words of Lisa Simpson, if you take away our cartoons, we'll grow up without a sense of humor and be robots. Thanks for listening to this look back at The Simpsons. I hope it was as much fun for you as it was for me. And thanks to my amazing guests, Matthew Clickstein and the delightful Yardley Smith, who in her spare time hosts a cool true crime podcast called Small Town Dicks. Yardley is joined by identical twin police detectives Dan and Dave, and together they break down big crimes in small towns. I'll put a link to Small Town Dicks in the show notes, along with the book Springfield Confidential, which I highly recommend if you're a Simpsons fan. This episode topic was suggested by a bunch of our listeners, including John and Mimi. Thanks to them and all of you for the ideas that you sent me. If you have a topic you want covered, let me know. You can send me a message on Twitter and Facebook at 1990s History or on Instagram at That 90s Podcast. You can also email me at 90s at CuriousCast.ca. That's 90s at CuriousCast.ca. This episode was written and hosted by me, Kathy Kinzora. Our producer is Dila Velasquez, and sound design and final production is by Rob Johnston. See you next time for more History of the 90s.